um, about urbanization. I, I agree that's where the world will go. And the world's going to move to urbanization because you've given people no choice. They have to. And the people I worry about most are the poor. So I'm an energy person. I'm the Rockwood professor of, of energy here at Harvard. And I've done global energy calculations. So you should know if by 2050, if you save every bit of energy you use today, you do a perfect job in your business, perfect. You still need to double the world's energy needs by 2050. Because there's 1.6 billion people who have never seen, seen an electron in a wire. And there's 1.4 billion, billion low energy users. That's 3 billion people. And there's 3 billion new people coming. There's 6 billion new people. And they're coming into a non-urbanized world, poorer parts of the world, and they're going to be forced to move to the urban setting because that's their only way out. But it doesn't have to be that way. And so the question is for me with sustainability, first is I have great faith in this audience and you'll save me my 100% of energy we use today, which is 14 to 16 terawatts of energy. So you'll do it, and you're still in big trouble. And it's because of the poor. And so what I would like to do is figure out, can you start giving people energy in a personal way? Because by the way, if you do most surveys, especially the poor people who live in rural settings, or people, they don't want to leave the home they grew up in and have to move to a city, but they have to. It's their only way out. And so I'm a scientist, and I'll just tell you two little things where we've done in the last four years uh, where people don't have to move, and they can get all the energy they need locally. And once you have energy, you can acquire wealth, and you can manufacture, and all of a sudden you don't need to go to that big city for those six billion people. Um, and therefore, I believe the home or the hut in the village will be its own gas station and power station. So I'll tell you two little inventions we've been working on to do that. Now, here's something that's kind of interesting. Uh, this is for manufactured goods. I can predict the price of things simply by knowing its weight and cost. So if I take the cost of one of your buildings and, and then I divide it by weight, I can predict how much it's going to cost. Because this is a manufacturing intensive uh, business, I'm predicting all your buildings are around $10 per pound, the lowest thing. As, a Boeing 777, they built 74 of them in 2006. I just took the weight per pound. So this is how I do research. I do Google plots. That's a Google plot. I just get on Google and make plots. And then sound prophetic. Okay, so. <laughs> so now I have, a, I have a little curve and I can predict costs. Now, this doesn't work for pills, pharma. It doesn't work for commodity chemicals. It doesn't work for Intel chips. But it works for things you build, manufactured goods. And so you see you can never get cheaper than $10 per pound. So how do we build energy systems? You build one of them. They're very heavy. And when I multiply heavy times $10 per pound, I get around $1.5 billion. And then I set up a market, and ca that's a CapEx cost, capital expenditure. I need to put out $1.5 billion. And then I set up a market model to recover my CapEx and make a profit. Thank God that doesn't work for the poor because they don't have money. That's why you've forgotten about those $3 billion, because they can't work in that economic model. The one thing, this does work for everything. Really, it does work for McDonald's hamburgers. Okay, so um, that's how you build systems. I went and called McDonald's and I got the, just the weight of the hamburger, the bun, the tomato, and the lettuce. It comes out to $10 per pound, okay? So imagine a world, not the way you live, energy on the left side, 
But if McDonald's were to build energy, if McDonald's were to run their business the way we build cities and manage energy, you would build one big hamburger and then have everybody go to it and eat from it. <laughs> That's how it would work. And so um, the other alternative, if I want to move to the poor then, these six billion new energy users, and not have them urbanize, could I build an energy system like a hamburger? And so we set out to do that a few years ago. And it has to be cheap. To be cheap or inexpensive, it has to be lightweight. I can't have a bunch of engineers from the outset adding on what's called balance of systems cost, because when you start adding more engineering, cost goes up. So the question, which I call frugal innovation, can I invent things in the lab that work so simply that I get all the engineering to go away or minimize it and then keep it low weight, and if it's low weight, it will be low cost, and then can I do it in a distributed way? So here's, an, here's a solar energy system that's distributed. It's called the LEAF. And what happens with a LEAF is sunlight comes into it. You give the plant water. And believe it or not, the plant takes the sunlight and it stores energy by rearranging the bonds of water. And it makes oxygen and hydrogen. And I'm a chemist. And so I'm going to show you a, one chemical formula today. So, O, you take H2O and you split it to oxygen and hydrogen. You then know that when you get a plant, you eat carbohydrate, but that's the hydrogen, the 2H2, combining with CO2 to make sugar. That has no energy storage. As a matter of fact, it's zero energy storage. Plants do that in the dark. What they're doing is they're storing all the energy in the rearranged bonds of water to make hydrogen and oxygen. And people have been trying to do that for a long time. So it's a hard thing to do. They've been talking about, could we make an energy system like a leaf and be totally distributed? And that might be good for humanity. So I'm not going to tell you all the details, but I just want you to think about how a leaf works, because I want you to walk around today and look at leaves and decide they're your best friends now. Because light comes into them. The leaf doesn't know what to do with light, so it makes an electrical current, okay? And then it takes the electrical current, so leaves are buzzing with electricity. Do you know that? Full of electricity, so it's solar electricity. But it's not in a wire. That's why you don't get a shock when you touch it. But it takes the electricity that the sun generated, and then it says that's not a good way to store energy, so we'll rearrange the bonds of water and make oxygen and hydrogen. And so we thought, could we take things like silicon that are in your solar panels, they make electricity, but then you slap wires on them. You also have to build a module, and all of a sudden all the cost starts going up. So could I take the heart of a solar panel, which is just silicon, have sunlight come in, make, make the electricity, and then invent stuff that I could coat the silicon with, just coatings now, no wiring, no extra cost, and then do the same thing a leaf does, is split it to make water, oxygen, and hydrogen. And so on the left is the details of what now people are calling the artificial leaf because this thing works. Sunlight comes into the silicon. That's the middle piece where you see SI. It makes the wireless current. And then students at Harvard invented catalysts that could collect that current with no wires, just like a leaf. And then that could, they could rearrange water and split it to make oxygen. So that's the front side, the green side. So it's making O2. And on the back side is hydrogen. We're letting them mix, but you wouldn't let them mix. You would just collect the hydrogen and oxygen. You can put this on your windowsill, and it can keep up with the flux of solar light and just split water to H2 and O2. Don't worry about, am I going to use up all the world's water? Because when you recombine H2 and O2, you get the energy back out in a fuel cell, and you get the water back. So it's perfectly cyclic. Okay. As a matter of fact, 
Drew comes by my office now because I don't do anything. I just watch this bubble all day in my office. I, I'm absolutely worthless, I think, now. So I told you it would be a hamburger. It's a hamburger. The silicon is the hamburger. I have to protect the silicon with a piece of cheese. That's the ITO. The cobalt catalyst is the top bun, and the bottom bun is the other catalyst. This is very attractive from highly manufacturable systems because I can take silicon now and build an energy system just by making coatings. And I can hand it out to everybody. And you can even, this works in dirty water. I didn't tell you, this is a self-healing process. It fixes itself. So you can take just a puddle off of a ground if you have sunlight, it works. So that's frugal innovation, simple engineering, low cost, only the materials that are active are what I need. I don't have wiring and anything else I don't need. So that's one picture. That home behind me is a home in California. It's not mine. National Geographic just told me, show up, we're going to take a picture. That, that thing works at, that house is an expensive house. It works at 40 kilowatt hours. I have to split that much water per day to take care of that house at 40 kilowatt hours. Now remember, the sun's out half the time, so I, only, I could do, take care of that house for two days. For the poor, I could give the poor 2.4 kilowatt hours, which is 100 watts continually over 24 hours, by splitting one and a half drinking bottles of water. So that will be the new world you'll be living in someday. And I assure you, you're headed there whether you don't want it or not. It's just, I don't know when you're going to get there. Um, for urbanization, we set out to do a different thing. Could we make a battery that you could put in a house and store electricity? So the way I'm trying to store electricity is in a fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. You need a fuel cell. And I've finally gotten tired convincing the world to change their infrastructure, just like I'm sure some of you feel it's a big challenge. So if you don't want to fight them, you can join them. The one thing you guys do is you use electricity and wires in the ground. So could I build an energy system that you could have your solar panel on your roof, but then we could store the energy in a battery and send it back. But this is a special battery. It's called a flow battery. All it is is I take a big vat of water here and a big container of water here and I dissolve compounds in it, special compounds we made. When the solar panel's out, we charge, we put electrons in one side of the, in one vat and put holes in the other. You need positive and negative charge for current. And it's in water. And then at night, the sun goes down, we just flow, it's called the flow battery, over a, a charge collector and you can get all the electricity you need. That's energy storage. So we built one of those. It's 10 kilowatt hours. And now I could set that up on a microgrid. So I could take a bunch of little village huts in India and in one hut put this thing, have everybody generating solar panel electricity, use it during the day, but then store it in the hut. And then at night I could give them energy. The beauty of that thing is I could keep going because I could go to megawatts. Now this is for urbanization for you guys. I didn't want to leave you behind because you're going to be jealous once all the poor people are beating you guys up and living better than you. So um, if I go to a megawatt system or if I want to go to 100 megawatts, I just need bigger containers. And that's happening now. So I just want you to know all this is happening. Um, Lockheed Martin, to do that, you need big engineering. So I just gave last August everything to Lockheed Martin. And they're now working to commercialize this in under three years. The beauty of this is if a power company has large scale storage, it's to their advantage for you to have solar panels on your house because you can sell them electricity and then at night, they can make a profit by selling it back to you. 
So they will be the ones that subsidize your solar panels. You won't need governments to do it because power companies can make money off of it. They can't store right now. So it works in both worlds. And to end, I just want to tell you, I'm not suggesting anything that you haven't done before. In the 70s, you used to have big computers IBM owned, and you would go send your information to them, and they would send them back to you. That's what a grid does. Then personal computers came back. So that's all I'm saying. You can do the same thing with energy. It's just all new invention. And I just gave you two little stories that are happening locally here, but the science community is energized right now. And by doing that, your home does become a gas station and power station. And by taking the inequity of energy, where the rich have it and the poor don't, you then put the poor on equal fitting with you, footing with you, and then they will make the right choices in the future and actually save you. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you.